This is a case of a 60 plus year old lady with history of obstructive hydrocephalus managed by shunt implantation with multiple revisions in a different institution who was transferred to us in a comatose state on multiple IV drips, mannitol and hypertonic saline to lower the intracranial pressure. Of note, obstructive hydrocephalus is a serious condition where cerebrospinal fluid in the brain cannot circulate properly due to a blockage, leading to increased pressure and eventual death. CT scan of the brain shows the previous failed shunt catheter and confirmed the diagnosis of hydrocephalus. Per report, patient was comatose for nearly a week and family did not wish to proceed with another VP shunt procedure which would consist of surgical implantation of hardware in the brain to redirect the flow of CSF or even ventriculostomy, which would be the most appropriate thing to do here. Endoscopic third ventriculostomy was offered to the family, which consists of minimally invasive creation of a stoma or surgical hole between the floor of the third ventricle and perimesencephalic cistern, re-establishing the CSF flow without the need of implantation of a permanent hardware. Borrowing slides from previous cases, let's review the pertinent anatomy and the trajectory that endoscope traverses into the brain to achieve third ventriculostomy. Please pause the video and review the anatomy. In the operating room, the trajectory is simulated and rehearsed before making a small incision near the coronal suture and one to two centimeter off midline on the That's right the side. That's the trajectory. Endoscope is advanced through the parenchyma of frontal brain along a straight line into the lateral ventricle with foramen on Monroe immediately visible. Advancing the endoscope into the foramen of Monroe brings us into the third ventricle, and this would be the anatomy we would expect to find. However, due to chronic hydrocephalus and multiple procedures she has had before, her anatomy was completely distorted making it difficult to discern where to perform the third ventriculostomy. Given her desperate medical condition requiring the procedure and adequate experience of the surgeon, me in this case, resulting in a quick assessment of the distorted anatomy and revealing the most probable site for third ventriculostomy, the stoma was created, thus successful execution of ETV or endoscopic third ventriculostomy without surgical complication. Very gently, you can pass me the rigid one. You can see a thin membrane there, yeah? 
So it can be slow. As I continue steady and look at that screen, just, just look at the screen. Smallest error in judgment, an attempt in creating a stoma in an incorrect site can lead to devastating complications and death. Let's go through this procedure again while seeing through the high resolution lens of the endoscope and let's identify the pertinent anatomy. Endoscope is advanced through the bare hole and into the lateral ventricle on the right side. Primum Monroe and choroid plexus are immediately identified. This is the view we expect, advancing through the Primum Monroe and into the third ventricle. However, her anatomy is significantly distorted. Much like identifying eyes, nose, and brows in a distorted picture, we identify critical structures of this anatomy. Let's go into the third ventricle and see this distorted anatomy and identify each structure. The red structure, which is often referred to as vascular rete, is identified first. 
It is a capillary network associated with the infundibular recess and a key part of hypophyseal portal system that links the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary gland. The vascular rete in this region allows for a direct exchange of hormones, effectively bridging the nervous and endocrine system. Next, adjacent infundibular recess, which is a small funnel-shaped extension of the third ventricle that projects into the pituitary stalk, infundibulum is identified. Widespread mammillary bodies become somewhat recognizable now. We can make up the delicate basal or artery underneath the thick arachnoid membrane of the floor of the third ventricle next. Now we can recognize optic hiasm and clivus, knowing their relative location to structures we already identified. Our target to create a stoma for third ventriculostomy is now inferred, and it also is the thinnest part of the floor of the third ventricle, as they often are. Looking up, we can also identify the anterior commissure. Having identified all the pertinent structures in this distorted anatomy of the third ventricle, we retract the endoscope gently out of the foramen of Monroe, and one more time, confirm our approach and gain a broad view of the surgical anatomy. Through a perforated, wide-open septum pellucidum, due to the long-standing hydrocephalus, we can see the left lateral ventricle together with the contralateral foramen of Monroe and choroid plexus. Being satisfied with the accuracy of our approach and understanding of this distorted anatomy, we will re-advance the endoscope into the third ventricle and proceed with third ventriculostomy. A micro-grasper is used to tease open the thin floor of the third ventricle. Endoscope is advanced through the stoma and into the perimesencephalic cistern. Basal or artery is immediately identified posterior and clivus anterior to our stoma, as expected, confirming the accuracy of our approach. Liliquist membrane, an arachnoid membrane located below the floor of the third ventricle, is thick and scarred, and it is meticulously opened throughout to allow for the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid from the newly created hole using both micrograsper and endoscope itself. Inability to open this multi-compartment thick and scarred membrane 
is a common cause of failure of endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Post-operative CT showed modest radiographic response to her long-standing hydrocephalus with reduction of third ventricle volume and increased volume of cortical sulci. Most importantly, she immediately regained consciousness and was able to feed and groom herself independently shortly after this operation. However, she did require prolonged physical therapy and support. She remained shunt-free.